Hi, I'm Jonathan M0JSX, and as you may be aware already, I am distributing the Toads digital interface boards for the UK and also Europe, if you're interested. And they've now come into stock, as you can see. So what I thought I'd do today is actually build one and use it for a purpose. Now, you can use these things for a lot of different purposes. One to all the purpose would be in order to create a high power all Starlink node uh, or uh, this is what I'm going to do with it today uh, I am going to make it into a DigiPeter for APRS using Direwolf and the radio that I've got is the Yaesu FT1500 and the reason I've chosen this radio is because it has a data port on the rear so let's briefly look at the boards because there's the main board and the daughter board and then we'll talk about how to actually get this thing going. You can ignore the FTX one, that's not here. So this is what you get when you order both boards. So we'll get the uh, the main Toad's digital interface board itself. It's obviously just this centerpiece here and you can break off uh, the larger uh, or the extra bit of uh, PCB if you wish to. You don't have to keep it on. Um, and it's a fairly standard board. It's got a USB-C socket on the one end and it's got the unpopulated header. If you buy just the main board on its own, that is how it will be supplied, just the one board. If, however, you also purchase it with the daughter board, now this is the DI6 daughter board, just a little bit of captain tape on there, um, you can see that it also has an unpopulated header. It has a, a six pin mini DIN connector on that end, a couple of trim pots and a few various switches as well. Uh, the last thing that is supplied are the appropriate headers. Now, at time of recording, I've got actually the wrong headers in stock because I've got the uh, sort of two by threes rather than two by six required. However, you just put two of them together and you end up with a two by six. Uh, so I'm not going to make you watch this because watching someone soldering is dead boring. Uh, but what you need to do is you pop the headers, the male header into the main board and then solder that up on the bottom and pop the female header, also supplied the correct header this one, um, and you pop that on the bottom, sold that on the top, and hey, job's a good one, you're ready to go, and basically assemble the two boards. Now what you can add if you want to are some standoffs, which might be quite nice to uh, just keep the two boards separated. Um, I haven't got any, so I'm not going to, but uh, that's also a possibility. And if you're using, like me, uh, the DI6 with a radio that has a six pin mini DIN socket on it, well, then you can hop over somewhere like Amazon and I'll leave an affiliate link in the description down below for this one. Uh, this is just a six pin mini DIN, six pin mini DIN uh, cable. This one happens to be one and a half meters long. It wasn't that expensive. I think it cost me less than two pounds for this cable. Uh, but saves having to solder up a uh, 6 pin mini DIN connect connector because that's no fun. Right, I'm going to solder these uh, up and uh, then we'll get into the uh, next stage of building it. And through the magic of editing, it's a few days later and I'm in a different t-shirt, so we'll just acknowledge that to say that, yes, continuity is completely gone for this video. But there's a good reason. First off, I have installed the headers. So I've installed the header down here, the male header on the uh, main interface board and the female header on the daughter board. I've also snapped off all of the extra bits of uh, PCB material. That was really easy to do. I just got my handy Stanley knife and just etched along the uh, grooves and to the point where it was just a little bit flexible and took a couple of uh, strikes and just easily snapped it off. Then I started playing. Oh, I needed to do that, by the way, so that I could actually plug the USB connector in. Um, there's not enough clearance with the extra bit of board there in order to get the USB-C connector in. Then I went into trying to get this to work on Windows. Now, you're only gonna to need to do this next step 
if you are using Windows. Uh, if you're using Linux, you don't have to worry about this. And again, it's only what matters if you're wanting to do APRS, for instance, on Windows with Direwolf. Basically, the way in which the CM108 chip works is that it's emulating a volume down in order to send the carrier uh, squelch signal into usually a Raspberry Pi, but that could be any old Linux um, box. However, on Windows, when the carrier opens, when the squelch opens and that line becomes active, Windows interprets that as turning the volume down. So I was having this really frustrating problem where the radio I was connected to would open its squelch because it's listening, it's hearing an APRS packet. It would down the volume for the transmit and therefore when the DigiP2 actually went to transmit again, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't actually do anything because there was no audio. The fix for that was to, you can just see, snip the, uh, the appropriate pin on this header. So this is the volume down header. Um, and I have just cut that as close to the plastic as I could possibly do. Um, the other thought would be is to just completely unsolder it and you could probably just pull the pin all the way out. Um, I found just cutting it as close to the plastic uh, has worked absolutely fine. And then it's just a case of sandwiching the two boards together. I say, if you're using Linux, you don't need to worry about that at all. Just go ahead, solder all the pins and put the two boards together. Now all that's left for us to do is to grab our six pin leading cable. I've already plugged the other end into the radio and the radio is also connected to an antenna. So we can uh, just plug that in. And then it's also just a case of grabbing my USB C cable and plugging that into the main board. You can see that I've also popped a couple of ferrite uh, rings uh, on the cables. I don't think these are strictly necessary if I'm honest. I was just a bit concerned about RF getting in. I thought that was initially my problem. Turns out it wasn't, but always belt and braces. Some ferrites are always a good thing. Right, next thing, we'll hop over to the computer and we will uh, we'll configure Direwolf to make it work as an APRS Digipeter. Okay, so let's hop over to the uh, computer and I've already downloaded Direwolf. Uh, so this is as you download it from GitHub and I will link that down below and all of those just extracted it into this folder. So the first thing we're going to need to do is to configure Direwolf in terms of the audio. Now what we can do uh, is I have a shortcut to my sound. You can also get to this through uh, the control panel uh, but I just go ahead and rename all of my audio devices. So when I plugged this in for the first time it just came up as a USB audio device. So I just went in here, I did properties and just changed the name. By doing that, uh, both on the playback and the recording screen, it means that for the next step, identifying which is the right device is a lot easier. Because what we're going to do is just going to run Direwolf. So we're going to hit Direwolf.exe. There's no installer to do, nothing like that. Uh, it gets this little flag here, Windows is protecting your PC. We're going to click Run anyway. The next thing it's going to ask us to do is about Firewall, or at least it should. Okay, it's not, it hasn't, isn't for me. It might for you. It might ask you to, uh, to allow it through the firewall. If it does do that, just click allow. That means that if you wanted to connect uh, a sort of an APRS client like Pinpoint APRS to this, uh, you can do that using the TCP IP connection. What we're paying attention to here is we've got the available audio devices to receive and for transmit. So you can see here Toad's DI uh, is device number six for my receive and it's device number one for my transmit. So that's fine, so we're gonna close this. We're now gonna find the direwolf.conf file. If it does ask you what application to choose, just choose Notepad, and that's what we can see here. So the first thing we're going to do uh, is tell it the audio devices. So what we need to do is we need to unselect this hash here, and we are going to put in uh, six and then one. So that's configured for the audio. The next thing we need to do is tell Direwolf how to transmit. So 
uh, for, sorry, next thing we're going to do is actually put our call sign in. So I'm going to put my call sign in, uh, M0JSX. Obviously, you're going to put your call sign in. I'm going to move my keyboard down here as well. We're going to leave modem set for 1200. Um, and here we go, right, so then we'll come to PTT. So we are using PTT CM108. So we're just going to unhash that. That tells Direwolf that we're using GPI pins on a CM108 device. Perfect. We're going to keep scrolling down. And if we wanted to, and you probably should, uh, put in, change this one here, unhash this here, and then change your latitude and longitude and any details about that you want to put in uh, for your station. This will also tell it to transmit every 30 minutes. Uh, it's a good thing to do. For the purposes of this, I'm not going to because I don't want to give away my location, uh, but you should do that. When we run a when we run Direwolf in a minute, it is going to complain at me because I don't have that set up. And here we go, APRS Digipeter properties, and all we need to do here for a Digipeter is just unhash that. You can go through and start changing things here in terms of how it behaves. Uh, and it says here you can go to the use guide and aprsdigipeters.pdf if you needed to configure that a bit more um, explicitly. You could do that. Without getting too deep in, you can also set that direwolf up as an APRS uh, eye gate as well. Um, so you would need to uh, give it the server, unhashing that. For Europe, you're just going to go euro.aprs2.net. Um, and then also put in your call sign and whatever your APRS IS passcode is. There's a few websites on the internet uh, that will tell you how to find that out. Simply, I'm going to click save. I'm going to close this. And now we're going to run up Direwolf. Uh, there it is, direwolf.exe. As I say, it is going to complain to me. It is going to say, there we go. So it's going to say, um, it's telling me there's two GPO pins that it could and I should select it from. From testing, I've worked out that actually it's selecting the right one for transmit. Um, and it's also telling me that beaconing should be configured for channel zero when, deep, when APRS digiputing is enabled. We know that. I said it was going to happen. But here we go. So it's selected a particular GPO PIM for the PTT and it says it's ready. So if I was to grab my FT5 and we turn it on, hopefully it doesn't take too long to get an a, a GPS fix. We'll be able to transmit an APRS packet from here and hopefully see it come up on the screen. Well, in fact, it did repeat did you repeat there. It wasn't me, but there was an APRS packet that came through then. Um, and my radio has now just transmitted and there we go. So we can see that we've got the incoming uh, signal here, we've got the incoming packet. That's the digipeated packet. And there you go, that's where it's been, it's actually hit another digipeter and been digipeted again. So it's working. That's good. If it wasn't, and you can actually see here, it says audio input is too high. So there are two options here. We could either change the pot on the uh, daughter board. There's the little RX audio pot and we could just adjust that. However, we could also just hop into our sound settings uh, and change it here. So if we open this up, go to recording, Tobes DI, uh, we could change the level here and turn that down a bit. I don't know, maybe 40 would be about right. I'm not sure, but either way, we can see that in the space of not too long, we've been able to successfully configure Direwolf to work and also successfully digipeating APRS packets. Really useful if you want to uh, have an infill digipeter. That's what I use mine for most of the time here. Um, where I am is kind of like right in the valley. So if I'm out walking around town with my handheld, I'm not going to hit any other APRS digipeter because just there's none around me that I'm going to hit for my handheld. But by putting in a little APRS digipeter here connected to my main V2000 on the roof, well, that definitely can hit further away digipeters. So I'm able to bounce through here at home and improve the APRS network for, for this part of uh, the valley where I live. As I say, doing it on Windows is possibly the easiest thing to do. This isn't a video on how to do it on Linux at all. Um, maybe in the future we'll do it on Linux. You can certainly run this on a Raspberry Pi. And I think that's probably how most people would run Direwolf would be on a Raspberry Pi 
using uh, Linux. Uh, but as I say, I'm familiar with Windows and with Windows it is just so simple that you just run it from the folder. Remember these boards are not just for this particular purpose. These boards were actually designed with the thinking of uh, All-Star Link in mind. Maybe at some point we'll do an All-Star video on one of these. Uh, I know that there are, I know that Hayden's already done one though and so's um, T.O. And I think uh, Matt at TechMize is going to do one very shortly. But this is just to show that you can do more than just all star link with one of these. If you want to pick one of these up anywhere in the UK, you can visit my store down below and you'll buy directly from me. I will also link through from there to both uh, TO's store if you're in the US and also Hayden's store if you're in uh, VK or ZL. And you'll be able to pick up uh, the board and the daughter board if you want to. Um, from there, as I said, the daughter board, really handy because if you're interfacing it to a radio that's got a six bin mini din, it's perfect. You've got all of the protection on this board that is required. Um, you can solder directly onto the header if you want to, but you are going to have to put some outboard protection because it's just not designed to interface directly to your radio. Thanks very much for watching. If you've uh, liked this video, there's a button specifically for that. If you haven't, there's another one that seems to work just fine too. And if you haven't already done so, please do click on that subscribe button and also click that notification bell and you'll be told whenever I upload a new video. There's another video coming up over here that the algorithm thinks you'll like next. Until next time, 73. Bye-bye.